Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101. I am your host, Rick Loiza. This is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today we are going to talk about a player by the name of Marvin Bad News Barnes. He was a naturally gifted player who seemed to just be better than everyone else. He just made everything seem so effortless. Born in Providence, Rhode Island, he got his nickname because of his propensity to get in trouble with the law. In high school, he once tried to rob a city bus with some friends. They, they tried to rob the little box where the riders dropped their change in for the fair. Well, they did this at night when few people would see them. But here's the problem. Marvin is six foot eight and was the most famous high school player in town. He was a minor celebrity. Everybody knew who he was. He was also wearing his letterman's jacket with his name embroidered on the back. Uh, let's just say this was one of the quickest manhunts of all time. The police just went over to his house and picked him up. And this is just one example of the kind of person we're talking about. And I'll share a few more stories as we move on. Uh, now, after high school, he ended up staying home and he played for Providence College in the early 70s. In 1973, he set the NCAA record for most baskets in an NCAA tournament game without missing. He went 10 for 10 that night. Now, the record has since been broken by Kenny Walker, or rather, Kenny Skywalker, who went 11 for 11 in 1986. But anyway, Marvin was a monster on the boards. In 1974, he led the nation in rebounding. But then it was time to go pro. The ABA was in full swing back then, and they heavily competed for players coming out of college with the NBA. It was basically a salary war between the old ABA and the NBA for talent. Since both leagues wanted the best players, salaries were going up in both leagues. and That was good for the players, as the players now had bargaining power. They could now play the NBA team against the ABA team to get the best contract possible. Bad News Barnes was drafted second overall by the Philadelphia 76ers in the NBA. But he was also drafted in the ABA by the Spirits of St. Louis. And in the end, the Spirits were able to offer more money so Marvin, or as he called himself, Muse, went with the ABA. The NBA lost another player to that other league, the league that the NBA used to look down on, the one that used the red, white, and blue basketball. Anyway, Marvin comes in like an absolute beast. He's averaging 21 points a game and 13 rebounds a game during his first two seasons of the league. I mean, this guy is kicking butt and taking names. According to his old teammate, Steve Snapper Jones, if you know him, he's a Trailblazers announcer for many, many years. Well, they were teammates on the Spirits, and Marvin once grabbed a rebound, threw the outlet pass to a guard, and then raced down court so quickly that he was able to receive the return pass for a dunk. This guy could do everything. He was the entire package. He had every physical skill a basketball player could ask for. It was the kind of thing where even the other professionals were envious of the things that Marvin could do on the court. He was a truly, truly gifted player. So why isn't he more famous? Why don't we talk about him the way we talk about Walt Frazier or Lenny Wilkins or Wes Unseld or any of the other Hall of Famers from that era? Well, it's because Marvin also had what you might call idiosyncrasies. 
One time he was late for practice and the coach asked him why he was late. Well, he said he couldn't find his car, that he had lost it somewhere in downtown St. Louis. The coach asked him what he drives, which is a Bentley. I mean, how many Bentleys could there be in St. Louis in the 1970s? It's like saying you lost your Bugatti in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I mean, how many of them could there have been? Another time, he spent the entire pregame time sitting in the stands talking to a girl while the rest of the team went through the pregame warm-up. The coach was so angry with him that he said, I am not starting you, and he's going to come off the bench. So Marvin does finally get into the game late in the first quarter, and he ends up finishing with 40 points and 20 rebounds and the win. The dude was just off the chart dominant. This is a guy who also missed nearly every personal appearance he was supposed to make for the team. So the team would set up appearances for him uh, to go to a boys club and speak or attend a luncheon for a local charity or show up at the grand opening of a sporting goods store, those kind of things that players still do today. Well, he always missed. I mean, he just didn't care about this stuff, but he was the star of the team and he needed to be there. But he was completely unreliable. Again, this is also the same guy who would drive his Rolls Royce through the inner city of St. Louis and buy ice cream for all the kids around. This guy was a complete enigma. On another occasion, the Spirits had just finished a game against the Kentucky Colonels, who were actually one of the other great teams of the ABA. But anyway, they are getting ready to fly home to St. Louis from Louisville, Kentucky. Now, as you know, if you look at your plane ticket, the arrival time and departure times are based on the local time zone of the airport where you're departing or landing. Now, Louisville, Kentucky is in the Eastern time zone. St. Louis is in the Central's time zone. So the ticket says that they're going to depart at 8 a.m., but they are going to land at 7.59 and Marvin just simply refused to get on the plane. Uh, according, according to Bob Costas, who was a, the announcer, the famous Bob Costas, he was a very young basketball announcer back in the day and he worked for the Spirits of St. Louis. And according to Bob Costas, Marvin said, I ain't getting on no time machine. He literally walked away, went down to the rental car counter, rented a car and drove all the way home to St. Louis. He was not gonna get on that plane. But to me, one of the funniest stories has to be when the team was flying from New York to Norfolk, Virginia. So the team had just finished playing the New York Nets the night before, and the following morning, they're gonna have to fly to Norfolk, Virginia, where they were gonna play the Virginia Squires. So they're gonna get ready to fly south. Everybody in the team had to be at LaGuardia early in the morning because it was an early morning flight. But everyone's there except for Marvin. So the coach calls Marvin at the hotel and says something like, hey, get your butt down here, we got a flight to catch. He says no problem, hangs up the phone, but of course he doesn't even show up. He says he's going to catch a later flight. So the 9 a.m. flight goes and he's not on it. The 11 a.m. flight takes off and he's not on it. The 1 p.m. flight takes off and he's still not on it. By the time he gets to LaGuardia, all of the flights to Norfolk were gone. He's stuck in New York now. So with a little bit of creative thinking and the fact that he was a professional basketball player and had some money, he charters a private plane to take him from New York to Norfolk. Now let's fast forward a little bit to later that night. It's about 10 minutes before the game and the coach is going through his last minute instructions with the team. At this point, they're just assuming Marvin's not going to be there. So they're game planning for Marvin not to show up and they're going to try to have to win this game without him. And then suddenly, someone busts through the double doors in the back of the room, and it's Marvin. He's wearing a wide brim hat and a full length $10,000 mink coat. And he's also holding a bag of McDonald's full of hamburgers and french fries. And he announces, boys, game time is on time. Now, even as I'm telling the story, I'm almost rolling my eyes here. Can you feel what the other teammates were thinking as he busts through the door? But the coach decides, yet again, I can't start him. He was late. So again, puts him in late in the first quarter and he goes for 40 something points and 20 something rebounds. And again, they win the game. It's almost like he played extra hard in these situations just to prove that he is the most dominant player around. And this is the kind of pattern that would go on for the rest of his career. And another funny part about that story is that Marvin hadn't paid the pilot, the guy that owned the plane. 
So that guy is hanging around saying, give me my money. I just flew you down here. I need to get paid so I can go home. So somewhere during a timeout, you can see Marvin writing a check to this guy while the rest of the team is going through a timeout in a, in a discussion in a little huddle with a coach. But this is who Marvin was. And you see this today that as long as players continue to produce, most teams are going to put up with just about anything. And all of you see this in football, in baseball, even today in basketball. As long as the player is producing, the team tends to put up with a lot. But once the player stops producing, that's when suddenly the team figures out that maybe they don't need this guy anymore. And that's basically what happened to Marvin. Uh, while most of the stories I've just shared have a comical nature to them, these are hilarious, hilarious Marvin Barnes stories. Some of the stories aren't so funny. Back in college, he attacked a teammate with a tire iron. He was arrested, pled guilty, and had to, pl and had to pay the guy $10,000. And he was also put on probation for it. Later, when he was a member of the Detroit Pistons, he violated that probation by trying to carry a gun onto a flight at the Detroit airport. He ended up having to go to jail and he missed about half the season. He was absolutely horrible at his finances. He spent money like his pro salary was going to be there for the rest of his life. He had never given thought to saving any of it or what would come after his career. Uh, he just didn't think that way. The only thing that mattered to him was right in front of him at the moment. So eventually he goes broke and he resorts to burglary. He also gets involved in drugs and that's when his career really took a nosedive. He just wasn't the same player anymore. His final stop in the NBA was with the San Diego Clippers in 1980. And after they cut him, he ended up homeless for a little bit in San Diego. After several years of rehab, he finally gets his life back together and he moves home to Providence, Rhode Island. And he begins working with youth. And he delivered the message that you would expect somebody like him to, to deliver. And I don't mean to downplay that, but it is a strong message. It's a good message. And he had the experience that he needed to share with the kids of Providence. Basically, it was don't make the same mistakes I made. Stay in school. Work hard. Stay away from drugs. Save your money. And he actually did have a very positive impact on much of Providence's youth. I mean, he really was able to redeem himself and be a positive force in his hometown. And that's all is great. And I'd love to tell you that this is a total redemption story. I would love to tell you that he ended up living the rest of his life as this mentor slash coach or whatever, and he ended up having a really great life. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Late in his life, he got back into drugs. That was his Achilles heel. And while he was able to stay sober for long stretches, in the end, it was drugs that took him, and he died in September of 2014 at the relatively young age of 62. He was like a shooting star who came on the scene as bright as anything and quickly faded away. Those first two seasons that he played with the Spirits of St. Louis, those were the two best years he had in his entire career. He was the ABA Rookie of the Year, he made the All-ABA Second Team, and he played in the ABA All-Star Game as a rookie. In his second season, he made the all-star game again, but that would be the last time he would ever play at that level. At that point, the ABA and the NBA decided to merge, and the spirits of St. Louis were dismantled as part of the merger agreement. So for his third season, he ends up in the NBA, and things really, really fell apart for him. He would end up becoming basically a role player in the NBA. He played one year for the Detroit Pistons, where he had those legal problems that I talked about already. He played one year for the Buffalo Braves, then one year for the Boston Celtics, and then one final year back with the Braves, except the Braves were no longer in Buffalo. They had moved to California and went by a new name, the San Diego Clippers. So after just six years of professional ball, he was out of the NBA. And despite his drug problems, he actually was able to find a little bit of work in basketball. He played part of a season for a team in Italy, and then he played off and on 
for several years with various CBA teams. Uh, the CBA was the Continental Basketball Association, and it was like the AAA of professional basketball. It was right below the NBA, and he ended up playing parts of seasons for teams like the Detroit Spirits, the Ohio Mixers, and the Evansville Thunder. If he had been able to stay clean and focused on his craft, I believe that we would talk about Marvin Barnes in the same breath that we say names like Dave Cowens, Tiny Archibald, Paul Westfall, or Earl Monroe some of the other greats of the 70s. But it really just wasn't meant to be. As a fan, I guess it was better to have him for a few short years as a pro than to not have had him at all. I mean, in the end, for those two short years with the Spirits, he played basketball at a level very few players ever play at. And that's something to be appreciated. So here's to you, Marvin Bad News Barnes. This has been Basketball History 101. Join us next time as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care, and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.